Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Walter and Betsy Stern Conference Center here at Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Delighted to welcome everyone to a very special event, our inaugural Dialogue in American Strategy and Statesmanship featuring Senator Tom Cotton and Hudson Institute Distinguished Scholar Walter Russell Mead. Hudson is a policy organization focused on research and outreach to promote U.S. national security and strong and engaged U.S. international leadership. We were founded by the late strategist Herman Kahn in 1961. Kahn was, of course, a pioneer in national security strategy in the Cold War, and the Institute, under his guidance through today, has been distinctly international since our founding in 1961. We take the need for strong alliances seriously, and in the last few months alone, we've held conferences and workshops in places like Tokyo, Brussels, London, and Bangalore, among other locations. We're delighted to have Walter Russell Mead with Hudson as a distinguished scholar, non-resident, albeit, in strategy and statesmanship. Walter has an unmatched ability to put strategic and foreign policy issues in a broad historic perspective, showing the different currents that have shaped American foreign policy. This understanding is critical to deepening comprehension of today's unique policy challenges, and it's why his blog, Via Medea, which he does at editor, as editor-at-large of uh, the American Interest, is must-reading on both sides of the aisle in the U.S. Senate, here in Washington, and around the world. We're especially honored to have Walter's father, Reverend Lauren Mead, with us uh, in the audience today. Now, many think tanks here in Washington give platforms to leading officials and elected officials to make policy pronouncements, but this series aims to be something truly unique. We want to create a true dialogue for conversation, discussion, real conversations, not staged ones, such as is possible in Washington, on America's unique role in world affairs. And our intent is that this series will be a marquee series for Hudson featuring leading Republicans, leading Democrats, U.S. and foreign officials in open conversations, sharing their unique perspectives to, to try to elevate the debate on America's strategic challenges. Walter Russell Mead is, of course, ideally suited to undertake these dialogues, these conversations. And I should note at the outset that given that this is a conversation, not an interview, I want to warn at the outset that we may not have time for questions and answers depending on the flow of the conversation. Now, when we began this the series, when we first conceived it a few months ago, we had a very clear conception of what we wanted to do, and the idea was, was quite simple. Let's have a conversation that, unlike practically every other conversation in Washington, let's do something that is not driven by the news cycle. <laughs> well, well, unfortunately, <laughs> our lead off interlocutor, longtime friend of Hudson, didn't exactly follow the script. Of course, Senator Tom Cotton needs no introduction. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Nice to see another student of Harvey Mansfield doing well. He served uh, two tours as an Army Ranger in Iraq and Afghanistan, was elected to the House of Representatives, and he has very quickly emerged, shall we say, as a leading voice on national security issues in the U.S. Senate. We're honored to have you here, and we're looking forward to a, a great conversation. Thank you very much. All right, well, Senator, uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that not many freshman senators have had as much of an impact on American foreign policy discussions as you've had this early in their, in their first term, although to be fair, I guess President Obama hadn't finished his first term when he made quite a, quite a splash. But when, we, when I think about American foreign policy, I sort of try to start with the question, you know, what's it for? Why do we have, I mean, do we have a goal? Or are we just trying to deal with one thing after another? What in, how would you describe the goal of American foreign policy? First, Walter, let me, let me thank you for having me here and thank Hudson for having me here. I've long admired and appreciated a lot of the work you do. I think that the immediate goal of American foreign policy has to be to stop the worldwide descent into disorder and chaos that is going to be hurtful to America's interests uh, and threaten the lives of Americans. Now, the long, that means the long-term goal has to be the maintenance of global order in a way that favors American interests, protects our lives, reassures our allies, 
and deters our adversaries or any state that's not aligned? This is, this is a very ambitious set of goals. I mean, it, it's saying that... It the, is an ambitious set of goals yeah. that uh, was a bipartisan consensus for decades after mm -hmm. World War II, after we saw what happened in the 1920s and 1930s leading to World War II. But I don't view it as any kind of break from the long-term bipartisan consensus that presidents like FDR and Truman and John F. Kennedy were as much a part of as presidents uh, like Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan were. Yeah, I, you know, I... I tend to, to agree. I think we spent a lot of our first 100 years, 150 years of history as complaining about how badly the British were mismanaging the global order while nevertheless benefiting it from it as much as possible. And then when they seemed to be unable to carry that on, we sort of reluctantly, and it's kind of a last uh, uh, measure, and after trying everything else, we ended up trying to take on that burden, and here we are. Um, so how do we do that? What do you see are the, are the main principles or key keystones of American strategy to achieve this global order that you think is important? Well, well first we have to, to realize what we don't do and how we got to this point, and I, I think it's gotten a lot worse over the last six years under President Obama. We can't retreat from the world. We can't blame the world's problems on America. We can't think that if we simply come home and let the world take care of itself, that we're going to have an era of perpetual peace. I mean, that's a big experiment that's been tested before. And in this most recent test, we see that the alternative to American maintenance of global order is not <coughs> peace and stability. It is disorder and chaos. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that we have a strong military, by far the strongest in the world, so that no one would ever think to challenge us. I just gave a speech on the is that better? Just gave a speech on the Senate floor the other night for the first time saying that we need to substantially increase our defense spending if we are going to be able to preserve, or, to preserve order around the world, to protect our interests, to kill or capture terrorists, to ensure that Russia doesn't continue its revisionist activities in Ukraine and beyond, mm -hmm. that China doesn't threaten our allies uh, in the East. We have to use that, use that military force to also back up our diplomacy. You know, I, was just meeting with ambassadors from the Middle East this week, uh, and they said that most people in the Middle East don't view right now the threat of force as a credible threat of force. That's in part because of the president's worldview, but it's also, though, in part because of that uh, red line that he drew, and then it raced in Syria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and we have to be globally present. We can't simply come home. We have to have four deployed troops and ships and aircraft. And we have to reassure our allies that we are not simply looking out for their interests, that we also are accounting for their interests, which are sometimes aligned, but not always directly aligned. Iran with a nuclear weapon is a threat to all of us, but if you're a small neighboring state like Israel or the UAE, mm -hmm. it's a much more immediate threat than it is to the United States. So we have to accommodate and respect our, in, our allies' interests if we want them to participate in a global order that's going to favor our interest and protect American mm -hmm. lives. Well, what's the price tag? I mean, you know, what, what do you think we really need to be spending on defense? In my speech on the floor this week, I said $611 billion is the absolute minimum that should be spent next year, mm -hmm. uh, and probably tens of billions of dollars more than that. I take that number from the National Defense Panel, which was a bipartisan panel of eminent national security specialists like Jim Talent, Jim Marshall, to take two former members of Congress, Eric Edelman, Michelle Flournoy, two former senior uh, officers in the Department of Defense, and they took that number from Bob Gates' fiscal year 2012 budget, uh, and they used that for a couple reasons. One, Secretary Gates had already cut and reformed almost $500 billion worth of savings in the Department of Defense. Uh, and second, that budget was assembled and submitted in late 2010, early 2011, meaning that it was the last time the Department of Defense has done traditional threat-based, strategy-based budgeting before the Budget Control Act. Now, they say that it's hard to know exactly how much more it would be, uh, over $611 billion, but that should be the minimum, the starting point. And I would say that that is very affordable. If you look at where we were in 1981 when Ronald Reagan took office, when both President Reagan and congressional Democrats viewed our defense spending as dangerously low given the threats we faced, it was about 5% of our national income. Last year, we barely spent 3.5%. If we were to have spent 5%, we would have spent $885 billion. So it's not a question of affordability. It is a question of our political leaders prioritizing what is the fundamental priority of our federal government, and that's to protect Americans.
I mean, I, I think you brought up there one of the most interesting points is that even though we hear a lot of talk about the cost of the defense budget, in fact, it is, uh, um, as a percentage of GDP, it's actually declining, the amount that even defense hawks would think is, is necessary that during much of the Cold War we had defense budgets that were 6 percent or 8 percent of, of GDP, um, and I think on average it was, it was above 4 during the GDP. I'll have, to, I'll have to go back and check that to be sure. Um, so what, you're, what we're talking about here is not, I think, by any kind of historical standard, anything outrageous. It's not outrageous at all, and in the long term it, it just cost, these defense cuts cost us more than they could ever possibly save us. Right. Uh, first, your enemies ultimately catch up with you. They caught up with us in the late 1970s, they caught up with us on 9-11, and you have to increase defense spending. And because of the intervening trough in spending, it co costs a lot more money to get to the same end state of military readiness and modernization <coughs> than it would have if you'd simply maintained a steady defense uh, budget. Second, I mean, the prosperity at home depends increasingly on a growing worldwide economy. And that depends on stability and order. Mm -hmm. and who provides that? The U.S. military. Well, what do you find when, when you're back in Arkansas, which is a state where a lot of people, like in a lot of American states, are kind of worried about meeting the weekly budget and paying for college and this kind of stuff. And you start talking to them about global order and far-flung responsibilities and $600 billion for defense. What kind of response do you get? Uh, widespread support, uh, and I, I can give you a couple examples. Uh, first, I uh, just came off the campaign trail, and my campaign, like many other campaigns for Senate last year, uh, had national security front and center. Uh, you had Putin invading Ukraine. You had the Islamic State cutting the heads off of American citizens. You had hundreds of thousands of new illegal immigrants crossing our border, an Ebola outbreak in Western Europe or Western Africa. That, those are not necessarily all core security threats. Some are, but they all feed into the perception, which is correct, of global chaos. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was a centerpiece of our campaign uh, that we focused on America has to lead in, the, lead in the world and that a strong America means an America that is providing global order. And then just last month, uh, I was home for the entire uh, week-long uh, work period in the middle of February, and no matter where I went, it could be an official meeting you know, with uh, you know, constituents at a town hall, it could be meeting um, with state government officials, just going to Walmart or being at the gym, people walking up to me. Uh, by far, the most common question was about national security. In fact, I would say national security questions and comments outnumbered other topics all combined. Obamacare, immigration, debt, and those are all important issues, but national security outnumbered all questions or comments combined. That's very interesting because Arkansas as a country doesn't have any sort of coastal, it's, it's, not, it's not one of the states you would think of where people are automatically oriented toward thinking about but we, foreign But affairs. we have proud Americans who believe yeah. in American exceptionalism and believe in crushing our enemies whenever they challenge us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, what do you say to people, and this is one of the classic sort of Jeffersonian arguments for a smaller foreign policy, that when the U.S. is active overseas with these military forces, whether it's building democracy, promoting trade, or any of the other kinds of things that we do, we end up attracting extra hostility so that countries might resent some of the stands that we take or whatever, and then that makes us more of a target. So that we end up just with a bigger and a more expensive government and more risks overseas, but we're not actually safer because more people hate us. I just don't think it's an accurate reading of the historical record. Uh, and you, if, you, if you talk to ambassadors or foreign leaders right now, as I have done, you hear them crying out for American leadership, for strength uh, abroad from America and reassurance of those allies. Uh, moreover, if you take the example of, say, terrorism, uh, I don't think Islamic terrorists attack us for anything we have done, our support for Israel or stationing <laughs> troops in Saudi Arabia. They attack us for who we are for the way we worship our God, for the equal rights that we give to women, uh, for the freedom of expression we grant to everyone, for peaceful elections based on people's own preferences. And, and that's not just me saying that. John Kelly, the Marine General, who is the Southern Command commander, testified mm -hmm. about that immediately, or just last week at our Armed Services Committee hearing. Uh, 
at responding to your question about Guantanamo Bay and its use as a propaganda tool. And there's no doubt that it appears in terrorist propaganda, but Guantanamo Bay did not exist when Iranian-backed terrorists blew up our embassy and our marine barracks in Beirut. It didn't mm -hmm. exist whenever the Kobar Tower uh, barracks were blown up. It didn't exist when our embassies were blown up in East Africa. It didn't exist when the USS Cole was blown up. It didn't exist on 9-11. If we moved all those prisoners to Charleston or any other naval facility, that facility would simply be featured in prop terrorist propaganda because they don't need a reason to attack us based on our actions. They have all the reasons they need based on who we are. And we're not going to change who they are, who we are, mm. to accommodate them. Well, you know, some would say, okay, that's all very well and good. You know, American power has this goal. But if you look realistically at the world, you see the growth of other powers, you see the growing complexity of the world. America's not growing as fast as China economically. So over time, if, you believe, if you believe government statistics. <laughs> in either case, I suppose. Um, but uh, so in time, people say, uh, the U.S. has to get used to a, uh, a weaker international position, relatively anyway. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, the goal of American foreign policy, they would say, might be to try to manage decline. How would you, how would you respond to that? Again, I would say it's not supported by the facts. Uh, if you look around the world, for all of our problems domestically, for the slow growth, uh, for the high uh, un or underemployment rates, um, I think that America is still the world's preeminent power. Uh, you can argue that China is a rising power, but China faces a lot of their own challenges as well. Uh, but if you look around the rest of the world at both our allies and our adversaries, America is one of the key sources of economic strength and world order. So I do not think we're in decline. We may be in retreat, uh, which is a point that Brett Stevens makes in his recent mm -hmm, book. Mm -hmm. Decline is, the, is a result of broad civilizational changes um, like Russia is going through, a falling uh, demography, commodity-based economy when commodity prices are falling and so forth. Retreat is a political choice. It's mm -hmm. not dictated by resources or capabilities or so forth. So what would you see as the source, ultimate sources of American power in the world? I mean, you know, why, why are we rich enough so that we can be the world's greatest power with 4% with or less of our GDP? What, what is it about the United States that makes well, there, us? I mean, there's lots of concrete sources of power. Um, our, our wealth, we have by far the world's largest economy the military that that allows us to create, our special place as the world's only hemispheric hegemon, which means the, only, the world's only uh, global hegemon, um, the kind of international institutions that we have shaped uh, for 70 years now, the IMF, the World Bank, World Trade Organization, and so forth. Those are all very concrete sources of American power. But in the end, those are all just manifestations of the true source of American power, which is the principles on which we're founded. Mm -hmm. You know, equal rights for all men and women, you know, the free, free and fair elections, the respect for individual rights from our government, private property rights, market-based capitalism. Yeah. The, it's those ideas that ultimately drive all the concrete expressions of our power. I have to say, I mean, I, I probably don't spend as much time with foreign ambassadors as you do these days, but, but I do uh, spend a lot of time traveling and talking to foreigners about um, What's going on in this country? And I will say the thing that has impressed them the most in recent years has been the renewal of American energy production. And that strikes me as kind of a textbook case of this. The, the U.S., almost uniquely in the world, has a uh, legal system where if you own land, you own the mineral rights under that land. In a lot of countries, the government owns that right or someone else. So. In a lot of countries, the worst day in your life would be when somebody discovers oil or gas under your farm because it means that, you know, er, your, your community is going to be disrupted and all kinds of terrible things are going to happen, and you're not going to get a whole lot of compensation out of that. So the NIMBYs are very focused. In the U.S., we've got, I think, when it comes to drilling for oil and gas, a lot of plimbies in, in the country, please, in my backyard. Um, and, you know, maybe there'll be an ugly oil derrick out of your kitchen window, but you, on the other hand, will have a really nice house in San Francisco or someplace, and you don't have well, to I, look at I it. Can t I can tell you in Arkansas, most people would be very happy to find oil or gas on the exactly. farms. And, in fact, the Fayetteville Shell in north-central Arkansas was one of the first major shale gas production fields uh, in America. And I was, I was in the Army uh, for much of the time it was coming online, but it seemed like every time I was home on leave, for a long weekend or for a holiday, there was a new apartment building or a new off-ramp uh, 
in Conway, Arkansas, which is the southernmost population center right at the edge of that of that gas field. Yeah. Um, and you're right that you know property rights, the way our, we traditionally define property rights in America, to give you control of the minerals underneath your land has is a unique and underappreciated feature of the shale revolution in America. But it's also American ingenuity. Right. I mean, other other countries may have even bigger shale formations, but they may not be able to access them because they don't have the kind of education right. system we have and the rewards that we give to people to go become petroleum engineers or geologists or geophysicists or so forth. Right. And Acce we access to capital, you know, that we can pull together capital in so many different ways that are not available in the world. Yeah. Well, I, I know some Mexicans were talking to me somewhat enviously of our culture where, again, because you have so many deals between sort of a small wildcatter and a farmer or something like that. We've got these thousands of firms that are out there trying new technology and so on and can simply look for a resource in a way these big state-owned uh, companies have not managed to do. So this, to me, is an example of, of maybe, and it's a good argument against American decline, it's that the cultural and social and, and legal framework that made us what we are still seems to be working. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, the price of oil now has fallen by 50% from its high last year. And many people thought that was going to be a disaster for shell producers all around America. And certainly some rigs have come out of the fields and uh, some fields have been idled. But I don't think min not many as, uh, as was predicted six months ago. And that's in part, be I mean, it's in part because different economics of geological <laughs> plays and the cost of transportation and so forth. It's also because, it, as is often said, if there's a, uh, a way to make a buck fixing a problem, the problem's probably going to be fixed in America. Uh, and a lot of people are making a lot of money. Right. Uh, and providing a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity by getting that oil and gas out of the ground, which is great for our own economy. If we were, if we were smarter, it'd be good for our security interests as well, not just making ourselves yeah. less dependent on oil and, uh, from abroad, but also helping our allies who are often under the stranglehold of petrostates control over their resources. Right. Well, it is actually amazing when you think about it. Right now, we've got the crisis with Russia. We've got the crisis sanctions on Iran. We've got... Uh, uh, Libya in complete chaos, we've got instability in, in Nigeria. Under normal circumstances, the price of oil would be shooting up and there would be sort of panic headlines and the world economy would be in all kinds of danger as these high oil prices went through. But because of this shale revolution, uh, actually oil prices are tumbling. The Saudis, I think, gave us a hand. My sense is that one of the reasons they haven't raised the price of oil is because they want to give Iran some uh, some trouble. But in any case, our, geopol our internal structure is changing and affecting the geopolitical climate in a way I think some people don't see, which in my view backs up your, your contentions about the future of American power. So, but let's, let's move to something, uh, a, a less happy subject, and that is um, what I sometimes think of as the Lord Voldemort War, the conflict against him you know, they who must not be named. Um, are we in a global war on terror? What, what, what is this thing that uh, keeps, keeps happening this morning, this well, terrible news from Tunisia? Uh, well, the global war on terror is the conventional uh, name, uh, which is fine, for what is a war against Islamic terrorism or Islamic radicalism. Um, that's the kind of terrorist, that's the kind of radicalist, r radicals that threaten the United States uh, threaten our allies, threaten our people. Um, and we've been in, in that war for decades now. We were awoken to the true threat of the war on 9-11, uh, and we're not winning. I mean, the president used to say that al-Qaeda is on the run during his last campaign. Um, I guess you could say that he was right after a fashion because they're running wild all around the world right or, now. Or running to ISIS recruiting you know, centers. So, or, his, you know. I mean, his, you know, they control more territory than they did 15 years ago. And the director of national intelligence, Jim Clapper, just recently testified that when all the statistics were rolled up, in the almost 50 years that these statistics have been kept, 2014 will be the worst year ever for global terrorism. So this is a, it's a global, it is global, it is a war, and terrorism is one of the tactics that the enemy uses. Uh, how do we win? Well, we don't win by apologizing for our supposed transgression or retrenching or retreating from the world. We don't win 
by trying to accommodate Islamic terrorists who want to kill us. We have to confront them and we have to show, as Osama bin Laden said in his famous statement from the 1990s, that we're once again the strong horse. He said that you know, when people see a strong horse and they see a weak horse, they by nature root for the strong horse. And in that, he was not criticized. I mean, he talked about Somalia and the retreat from Mogadishu uh, in the fall of 1993. He was not criticizing America for being too active in the world. He was mocking America for being too timid. Mm -hmm. As soon as they get, get a single punch in the nose, they retreat back to their own shores. So we have to show Islamic radicals that we will not retreat. And unfortunately, I think the president has shown them the opposite of that. So let's take Syria. Uh, ISIS, what should the American response to a problem like ISIS be? And I don't expect you to have a detailed five-point plan here, but yeah. just sort of trying to conceptualize it and think about how do we come to grips with, with a force like this. Well, I, I'd, I'd look at it today. I'd look at it four or five years ago. But I'd, I'd say today, the um, question is Syria. The answer, as it is to most things in the Middle East, is Iran. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is largely not in control of Syria anymore. He's even more dependent on Iran for support uh, than he ever was. I mean, he was almost defeated in late 2012. Um, this is one reason why I think why the president was willing to say that Bashar al-Assad had to go, because it didn't look like he was going to have to do much to force him out. But that's when Iran truly began to pour in millions of dollars in weapons and equipment and put in IRGC forces as well as Hezbollah proxy forces. But I thought our sanctions on Iran had brought them to their knees. Unfortunately, uh, if it, the sanctions had brought them to the knee, their knees, uh, Barack Obama, as is, is his tendency, gave them a hand and let them up off the mat. Which is what I learned to do playing basketball in Dardanelle, Arkansas, is the sportsmanlike thing to do to your rival. But in the Army, I learned in hand-to-hand -hand combat, when your opponent is on his knees, you drive him to the mat and choke him out. I love it, by the way, that you grew up in Dardanelle, Arkansas. Uh, great, great name for a town. Um, and so, so I, I think, you know, you, you can't look at the Islamic State without looking at the conditions under which it arose, which are go back at least four years. First, the president's imprudent decision to withdraw a mere ten to fifteen thousand uh, uh, troop force against the better judgment of his military commanders. Um, we're to the point now where we may have more troops in Iraq at the end of this president's tenure than we would have if he had just kept those troops on the ground at the time in 2011. Remember, the precursor of the Islamic State was al-Qaeda in Iraq. Yeah. The, the force that was fighting uh, American troops when I was there in 2006. The president's own deputy director of the CIA said al-Qaeda in Iraq was defeated in 2011. But by retreating in 2011, which encouraged Nuri al-Maliki to return to the kind of sectarian ways that he had largely abandoned in the late Bush administration. Uh, it created the opportunity to let al-Qaeda in Iraq off the map, and then the civil war in Syria, in which President Obama did not lead at all from the very beginning, it gave them the space to expand. And now they're basically rampaging throughout most of eastern Syria and northern and western Iraq. There's two fronts. I mean, there's a front from Aleppo to Homs to Damascus. In the west, there's a front from uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, which is the Kurds on Iran, but then down to Baghdad and Najaf, Najaf, which is Iran. Both those fronts are controlled by Iran. And it seems like our de facto policy right now is as long as those fronts don't fall, then the Islamic State can have, and the Islamic State doesn't attack outside of those borders, they can largely have that territory to itself. I mean, the president is reported to have sent a letter to Ayatollah Khamenei, a private letter, Last fall, that said, <laughs> last fall, that said, that said, uh, that he would recognize Syria as a legitimate sphere of interest for Iran, and that he would not touch the Assad regime in the campaign against the Islamic State. And now we have Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, a man with the blood of hundreds of American troops from Iraq on his hands, appearing like a social media phenomenon from Tikrit, leading Shiite militias. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to the Middle East in in a minute, uh, in a little bit, but. I want just just on the war on terror, the, we often think of it in terms of the Middle East, and that, a lot of it is there. But one place where it seems to me people have underestimated the chance for things going really badly is across Africa, where you have not only Boko Haram, which is now joining ISIS, but if you look across Kenya and Tanzania, you can see a, almost a, a band of conflict. And these are all maybe in origin, very local conflicts, 
but religion gets into them on both sides and funding comes in and we're looking at potentially a, a, a religious war across parts of Africa. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's a large uh, crescent in which you see those kind of localized right, insurgencies right. at first that have a, have a tendency to grow into larger and oftentimes internationally affiliated groups. Right, and like, there's funding like for around. them and help there's, if there's they say, well, I'm part of this big thing. That's not, that's not to say that American troops have to be on the ground fighting what is every local insurgency, but we have to be preserving a, a global order, a set of, of norms and institutions and providing support to local forces, whether it's intelligence support or foreign aid or military assistance or what have you, that helps them have stable, stable state institutions that can counteract what are local problems before they become international problems. And I mean, that, you see that throughout the history of American foreign policy, that it is much better to act early rather than to act late. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's pull back from the, uh, the war here and, and think about kind of, again, in a very big picture way. You know, I look at, I look at Ameri where American foreign policy is focused and we, you know, you can think of three regions that historically the U.S. has, has seen as central to its, to its interests, um, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. And, you know, Latin America and Africa we, we can talk about as well, but where do you see American foreign, how does America advance these goals that you talk about in Asia? What do we need to do? Well, China is the one true rising uh, power, and China clearly wants to establish regional hegemony throughout East Asia. Um, China's uh, increasingly got control on its borders, which is historically a challenge for China because of its long land borders, and now it's looking outward uh, to the so-called first island chain. Starts peninsula, the Korean peninsula, and on down through Japan, and Taiwan and the Philippines and the Indonesian archipelago. If you look at their military expenses, they've increased by 600% in the last 15 years. And that increase uh, is clearly directed against the United States, pursuing what's called an anti-access or area denial strategy, which is designed to keep American forces out of that chain and create you know, the, the East and the South China Sea as largely a Chinese Mediterranean. So what we have to do is to be ready to counteract that strategy. That's why we need a bigger Navy. That's why we need a bigger Air Force that's capable of global power projection. And why we have to keep reassuring our allies that we are going to be committed. Mm -hmm. We are committed to our secure, security guarantees to South Korea, to Japan, to Taiwan, and so forth. Um, I spoke with someone who visited with some senior Japanese ministers um, about a year and a half ago, shortly after the uh, president erased the red line in Syria. Uh, and you know, they're going through a discussion about expanding their military forces, perhaps even um, reconsidering the post-war constitutional prescription on overseas collective defense. Uh, and they said that part of what was driving that in part was the president's decision not to uh, strike after Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons. And this person said, well, that's a little strange because you know, normally, you don't think East, East Asian politics being influenced by Middle Eastern politics. Said, but when you're talking about America's security, security guarantees, uh, the entire world uh, influences what we do here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if China were to become much more aggressive than it has been in the Senkaku Islands or the Spratlys recently, <coughs> and challenge one of these countries more uh, directly, you know, I think they have real questions about whether America would uphold their security guarantees, and that would cause them to either you know, conciliate with China or perhaps confront them, and neither one of them would be healthy to uh, regional stability. That's why America's commitments have to be ironclad. Some people say that China might be looking to make kind of a, a bit of an end run. Yes, they're competing militarily, but it'd be a long time before they could really truly be a peer competitor to the U.S. on, on a broad range. But in the meantime, I mean, just this week they've had a interesting diplomatic victory where a number of our allies are joining a uh, Chinese-led investment bank in Asia that the U.S. government had said, please, you know, quite loudly said, please don't join. And so I think for, you know, the, can China, does China have a lot of resources here that it can deploy? And if so, do we counter that? Do we embrace it? How do we handle the fact that China is a major economic player? Well, they are... Uh a rising economic player. I w would say that they have real challenges in their economy, though, until they have a true market-based economy with price signals without the kind of political corruption you've seen. 
they will not be able to compete in the long run with the United States. Um, but they do have, you know, uh, rising economic power. And in the example you give on the International Development Bank, perhaps it would have been better for America to uh, get involved from the very beginning mm -hmm, rather mm -hmm. than, you know, try to dissuade allies who are apt to get, get involved in part. So if they're doing something that might be positive, join in. Well, if it's going to produce profits and our allies are going to do it and we have a chance to influence it, as we've influenced every major international institution for the last 70 years, then I think we should consider... Uh, whether we adopted the right policy or not. Okay. Uh, some people look to India as a key element in American strategy going forward. Do you share that view? I do. Uh, you know, they're the world's second largest uh, country, and they have their own regional. Second uh, largest by population. By population. Yeah. Yes. They're, they have their own. They have their own issues uh, with China as well. The Indian Ocean is increasingly, you know, the global superhighway for uh, sea-based <laughs> commerce. Um, China recognizes that. You know, they recently opened uh, secured port rights in Sri Lanka. So I, I think we should be deepening our ties with India and trying to trying to promote further market-based reforms there under Prime Minister Modi and trying to encourage the continued development of true democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it, it is interesting to see that our alliance network in Asia has been getting stronger in part as other countries have responded to what they saw as a Chinese aggressiveness, uh, countries, whether it's Australia, Japan, a number of others, have been tightening their links to the U.S. Do we need to, would you be in favor of rethinking an alliance structure in, in Asia, trying to make something more formal? Do you think it's premature? How, do, how would you look at that? I would, right now, I think it, it's important that we continue to reassure all of our bilateral allies. I think, you know, mm -hmm. as, as the situation evolves, we can look at a more formal multilateral structure, but the critical thing for the time being is to ensure that countries like South Korea and Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines and Australia, to name just a few, understand that we are going to be a credible ally and it will be a deterrent mm -hmm. uh, towards China's uh, regional hegemonic ambitions. Now one thing that you will hear from people in American politics about our Asia policy is that a lot of it is based on trying to promote free trade with Asian countries, many of whom pay factory workers much less than, than we do, China obviously being one, but there are many others. And so they look at you know, free trade agreements across the Pacific and so on as, as undermining the economic security of ordinary Americans. Where do you come out in this whole debate, and how do you think we should be managing well, our trade I th relations? I think traditionally and generally, uh, when America leads the world in free trade, America is both stronger and more prosperous. It deepens those, those ties that bring us closer together and that help us have more influence over our allies' behavior and sometimes even adversaries, or at least rivals' behavior. Um, now, I want to drive a hard bargain. I want to open up as many markets for mm -hmm. America's manufacturers or Arkansas rice producers mm -hmm. as I can. But in general, uh, the more we trade and the more we lead with free trade, the stronger uh, we will be. Okay. And I mean, you know, the countries like China, you know, are increasingly are facing, you know, the traditional middle income uh, trap. You know, this, as, as they grow, you know, part of their comparative advantage over the decades has been very low uh, wage rates. So they mm -hmm. can produce anything that requires a lot of touching, you know, so textiles, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a very big competitive, uh, comparative advantage. Um, you know, higher tech manufacturing that is more uh, based on advanced technology, we still have an advantage of, but you know, any kind of labor-intensive um, manufacturing, they have some comparative advantage because they had such low wage rates. And that's not just China, that's much of the developing world. But as the world develops, the wage rates begin to increase, and then that kind of uh, traps them in uh, the middle income trap, mm -hmm, uh, as mm -hmm. it's been called, because their comparative advantage uh, begins to decline. Yeah, which, which has been a problem for a number of, of countries and may well turn into one for China. We, we don't know yet. Um, well, let's, let's go from Asia to Europe. Uh, I was just in Italy last week, and I can tell everybody here that I strongly recommend that you all go to Italy. And I'd like to issue, as an American, a heartfelt thanks to the Europeans for reducing the, the euro against the dollar. It made my visit significantly uh, more pleasant. Uh, and I would urge, by the way, any American students watching this, complete your educations this summer. Go to Italy. Go to, uh, go to France. There are a lot of wonderful places waiting for you to visit. But 
from a more sober standpoint of world order and so on, what we're looking at and it's a little bit troubling. I mean, on the one hand, we've got Russia, which is taking a very different attitude, and then within the European Union, we have these really deep splits, and some of our allies, like Germany and, and Greece, both members of NATO, are, are really not getting along very well. Where, where do you see American foreign policy going in Europe? What should we be doing? Well, things have certainly changed in Europe since the Pentagon assessed that er Europe was a net exporter of security in the world. Uh, I don't think you could claim that anymore. <laughs> and I mean, the greatest crisis that Europe faces is a revisionist Russia uh, driven by Vladimir Putin. Um, so I, I think right now it's played out in Ukraine, maybe not the exact place that Western policymakers would have expected or predicted or hoped for, but that's where we are. Um, and I think, you know, the West doesn't see itself as Vladimir Putin sees it. The West, especially Western European leaders of all stripes, elected, bureaucratic, technocratic, financial, um, think that history really has ended. That they have the one right way, they can manage the world, um, and people like Vladimir Putin know that. I don't think he sees that. I think he sees the West as something of a paper tiger, um, true of the United States, but the United States is somewhat distant and you know uh, has its issues around the world, but especially when you look at Germany. Um, and you look at Germans, re Germany's reluctance to do much about what's happened in Ukraine. Um, but we also have to remember that Vladimir Putin is much weaker than the Soviet Union ever was. His country is smaller, uh, it's much poorer, uh, it's military. Uh, the NORAD commander testified last week is qualitatively better, but quantitatively it's much smaller as well. Mm -hmm. So he's got a much weaker hand than does the West. Uh, he simply seems to be playing it better. So I think the West has to take a stand and has to say that Vladimir Putin's revisionist uh, expansionism <laughs> in Ukraine is not going to stand. Uh, because if it stands in Ukraine, and not just in the Donbas and eastern Ukraine, but you know, he still has forces staged outside Maripol, which would give him complete control over the Sea of Azov and pr pretty soon open up a land bridge to Crimea, who's to say that we won't see little green men, uh, which is to say, you know, non-uniformed Russian special forces in eastern Estonia or eastern Latvia. We have large Russian minority populations. And that would either precipitate war or obsolescence of NATO, depending on what Western leaders do. Yeah. Now, so it's, it's, time, it's time to confront Vladimir Putin and make him realize that the West actually is stronger than he is and we will not tolerate the kind of revisionism that he's tried to engage in in the heart of Europe. I think the point you make about Latvia and Estonia is, is a really important one that you know, that when people think about a war between NATO and Russia, they classically think of the Russian tanks coming over. But, but suppose, just as you say, some little green men, some 25-year-old Russian-speaking young men uh, who, who don't have Russian army off, uh, uniforms but, but have Russian-issued rifles suddenly declare that a, a chunk of of Estonia or Latvia or some other country is now part of a, an independent entity aligned with Russia, well, we have a NATO treaty obligation to, to do something, but, but no shots have been fired, perhaps. Yeah, Estonia has already claimed that Russia kidnapped an Estonian security officer on its border last fall. And you're right that NATO traditionally, like in the, in the classic wargaming model that you know, I was still hearing about in the Army in the last decade, uh, 15 years after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the classic war game was you know, stopping a Soviet uh, tank invasion through the Fulda Gap in Germany. Uh, I can't say that NATO is prepared for that kind of irregular hybrid warfare of ununiformed special forces operations and uh, economic um, uh, stress and you know, working with local uh, uh, irredentist minority leaders. So. I think NATO needs to be prepared for it, but the best way to stop it to begin with is to stand up to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine and to help, help Ukraine become more like Poland and less like Russia. Well, let's, you know, that is not going to be easy. I've, I've myself been to Ukraine on a number of times in 1990, uh, 2005 or 2006 after the Orange Revolution and again just last fall. and. I have to say, uh, Ukraine is a country that's had three revolutions but no government since, since the fall of the, of the Soviet Union. And it looks to me like there's really no way we can resist Putin in Ukraine without, and I hate to use this word in a, in a Republican organization like, 
like Hudson, but nation building. And, you know, it's how do you get a banking system, how do you get an economy, how do you get the rule of law, all of this. How do we do that in Ukraine and how well, do we build a support or is that really not necessary? Maybe more state building than nation building. Okay, fair uh, enough. Cause I would, you know, you're right. Putin may have done the nation building <laughs> for us by You're right. That, I mean, you, you, Ukraine, like, like Russia in the 1990s, like a lot of former Soviet-occupied uh, countries, um, has had its struggle since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's been plundered by oligarchs in the way many other countries were as well. Um, but I do genuinely think if you, if you take stock of the current leadership, and I've consulted with senior Ukrainian leaders, uh, if you look at uh, their aspirations and their plans, they are actually ready to go down the path of a country like Poland. They don't want to return to the path that Putin lays out for them. Um, so there are problems with the Ukrainian state, you know, with its banking sector, its security services, and so forth. Um, but we do have models for how to, how to fix those problems. You know, if you can look to a country like Poland, uh, and you can even have role modeling done, mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, other NATO ally uh, countries that used to be part of the Warsaw Pact, Poland and Estonia and so forth, uh, to help build their institutional capabilities, because that's what they really need is institutional capabilities. Mm -hmm. They're already getting a lot of support from the IMF. Right. You could open up more uh, trade facilities with EU nations. I mean, that would be a good thing because a lot of the <coughs> EU nations need to increase their exports anyway, uh, and Ukraine could be, you know, a good importer of a lot of EU mm -hmm. products. So there, there are ways to, to use soft power, uh, to put it in a different way, to help Ukraine choose the path or go down the path that I think it wants to choose anyway. But <coughs> As always, soft power can only be effective if it's backed up by hard power. Okay. And that's, that's why we also need to provide Ukraine the weapons they've been asking for for months now. I mean, when, when bullets and bombs were called for last year, the president rushed blankets to the front, and we saw how that worked. Hmm. Okay. Um, what about these problems that, that uh, in Western Europe or in the EU they're now having with the euro, where we're seeing a lot of the economies are really flat on their back and and the Europe, the EU, which we've sort of counted on for all of its, all of the problems maybe Americans have with it over some issues, as being kind of a great shining hope for development of international cooperation and maybe a, a role model for other parts of the world, really looks in bad shape. Should the U.S. care about that? Should American people care? Is there something we can do to help Europe? Well, yes, the U.S. has to care about Europe. I mean, we can't pivot away from it. Um, it's one of the top global priorities. We should want a strong uh, and prosperous EU. I mean, many EU countries are NATO allies. We should want them to have the kind of growing economy that would allow them to start spending the 2% on national defense that our NATO charter calls for. Um, we should also want the EU to work out its internal divisions, you know, the northern and southern divisions that you've mentioned but also the Eastern and Western divisions. I mean, you have a lot of growth, mm -hmm. uh, more growth in Central and Eastern Europe than you have in some Western uh, and Southern Europe countries. Uh, I, I would say that's in part because um, those countries were able to kind of start anew in the 1990s and build real market-based institutions that don't have all of the inertia behind them that you see in some Western and especially Southern European countries. I mean, the path to EU prosperity is not all that different than the path to American prosperity. It's market-based economics where you can, you know, have flexible workforces where they actually work a full 40-hour work week, you know, where you've got taxes that are relatively low and predictable and regulations that are not strangling innovation and growth. Um, it's not the traditional European model, at least it hasn't been in recent decades, but there's no secret to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, if you look at a list of the 30 largest companies in the, uh, the current EU, 30 years ago and one in America today, it's remarkable because in America you have country, you have companies now that were not even uh, in existence back then, like Google, whereas in Europe the list is very, very stable and you know, that's not necessarily a testament to uh, superior corporate management. I've noticed our British friends are talking about taxing Google, so you know, you can't build a company, maybe you can tax it when other people have done it, I don't know. Um, well, now I think we come to the Middle East, where we've, we've already spent a little bit of time here. I remember uh, uh, reading something recently by Martin Indyk, who was, uh, who was President Obama's special envoy working with Secretary Kerry on the Middle East process. So it was certainly no enemy of, of the Obama administration. And I remember him summing up the, the American strategic choices in the Middle East as, 
either we go for a kind of a condominium with Iran uh, or we go for a, uh, a return to our kind of old alliances of Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, other countries willing to, to chip in with that. And what I thought was interesting was that uh, Ambassador Indyk said, well, there are a lot of problems with the second approach, the old alliances, but the first one, the condominium with Iran, is impossible. Um, what's, what's your sense of this? Is, is that a good description of choices would, that we face? He, I would say that he's correct, but uh, there's, a, I think, a third possibility that he doesn't list, which is a future in which Iran is not ruled by theocratic dictators. Mm -hmm. uh, for much of the Cold War, Iran was an ally of the United States, and there's lots of reasons why Iran could be an ally. It's a large country with a well-educated middle class mm -hmm. uh, that sits at a strategic crossroads. Uh, the Shah certainly was something uh, of a um, mixed blessing, I guess you could say. I mean, it was very repressive, and that ultimately led to his own downfall. But the Iranian people are a people that could be a natural ally with the United States. Mm -hmm. For the last 35 years, though, the Islamic Revolution has been leading them and exporting the revolution all around the world, killing Americans, killing Jews, toppling other governments. They now control five capitals in the Middle East, not just their own, but Baghdad and Damascus and Beirut and Sana'a. <laughs> uh, and as long as the Ayatollahs are in charge in Iran, then certainly we can't make any kind of rapprochement with Iran. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think the president has been doing that from the very beginning, uh, and that's um, that's one reason why I say the answer to all questions in the Middle East is probably Iran. It may even be the answer to Ukraine, given Russia's influence uh, in Syria mm -hmm. with Iran, okay. with whom they just entered a defense pact. Well, if, if uh, at least for now some kind of serious American detente is taken off the table with, with Iran, and it's, you know... I if think, only. Right. Uh, I think the White House has not reached that point, but just conceptually thinking, so what proposal, how would you restructure American policy in the Middle East, especially around Iran, if, <laughs> if the president came to you and said, Senator Cotton, okay, you know, I read the letter and I've thought about it, and uh, okay, what should I do? What do you tell him? Uh, I, I think we have to strengthen our traditional allies, all of whom are aligned against Iran, and we have to confront Iran's drive not just for nuclear weapons but for regional hegemony. Um, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, won the and his party won the election last night. They're going to take the first crack at forming a coalition government. Um, in the end, though, you know, although I, I respect Benjamin Netanyahu tremendously as a statesman uh, and equally, you know, as a former member of his country's elite special operations forces, whose family has sacrificed a lot fighting our common enemies. You know, we don't, our, our alliance is not with a single statesman or a political party, it is with the country of Israel. And Israel right now, as it always has been, is the bedrock of our alliances mm -hmm. in the Middle East. But give President Obama some kind of credit, only President Obama could drive Israel and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and all the other Sunni Arab countries even closer together than they ever have been. Because they all recognize they all recognize the danger that Iran poses to them. Not mm -hmm. just the nuclear threat, which is obviously an existential danger, a threat to their survival, not just their security, but also Iran's activities throughout the region. Yeah. Well, that's one thing I do wonder whether, um, looking at, at U.S. policy, whether maybe the president has sort of almost put the nuclear issue in a completely different level. So he's been focusing on getting a nuclear deal, which I think every probably everybody in this room, I think you and I would both think, in theory, is a great idea and certainly preferable to the alternatives, but um, but ignoring what's been going on on the ground in the region. So we've almost reached a point, or maybe have reached a point, where a lot of Iran's neighbors are as worried about the even more worried about the deal succeeding, and then Iran being released from sanctions and able to to then have more power and more money in the region, they actually may be hoping the deal, the negotiations fail. Do you get a sense of that? I certainly uh, get the sense directly from some of them uh, that they don't, they, they can't live with the, literally maybe not, they can't live with the 
a deal along the contours of the offer the president has made, the two key components of which is large uranium enrichment capabilities and some kind of sunset clause. Those two terms alone make any deal unacceptable, whatever the rest of the terms may be, um, because they, they rightly point out uh, Iran's economy has suffered from both uh, sanctions and from the uh, falling price of oil, yet they still are supplying um, Hezbollah. They are still on the ground fighting in Iraq. You know, the Houthis, an Iranian-backed uh, militia group, recently yeah. took over in Sana'a. Think about what they would do if they got all that money back, if, they, if we unfroze over $100 billion in assets. And then, of course, think about what they would do in a year or two years or 10 years if they got a nuclear weapon, when they're, when they're already driving for regional hegemony. And it would appear to many of them that the West is, that the United States is accommodating that and maybe even encouraging it, trying to have some kind of grand uh, turn of our alliances there. So they're, they're worried, yes, about the, in the long term about a nuclear Iran, um, but in the short term they're also worried about Iran's um, aggression in the region. And you would be too if you were one of the one of them. One of them recently said, if you were a, if 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 you were in the position, if you were in the position of our country's leadership, and I won't specify which country it was, but if you were in the position of our country's leadership, and Iran developed a vast nuclear industrial capability, would you stand idly by, or would you develop your own? So we might be promoting a, an arms race in the Middle East rather than than stopping one. Well, so. A nuclear Iran is very bad because they might use the weapon against us since they've threatened both Israel and the United States with elimination. It's bad because it will give them a nuclear umbrella to become even more aggressive, both in the region and in their worldwide uh, terrorism support. It will encourage Sunni states to get either nuclear weapons or become a threshold nuclear state, which rings the world's most volatile region with nuclear weapons. And a lot of those states, as we've seen in the last four years, are not necessarily the most stable government. So Islamic insurgents realize they only have to topple the right government to get their hands on nuclear weapons. So for all those reasons, a nuclear Iran is an existential threat to most states in the Gulf. Yeah. And I would say in the long term, the United States as well. All right. Well, we don't have a lot of time. As I, as I feared, the convers our conversation, we'd get so caught up in our conversation, we wouldn't have time for questions. But I can't resist asking one more about the hemisphere. I mean. The Western Hemisphere, thankfully, is one of the world's quietest spots geopolitically, but certainly we're seeing some movement in Venezuela, uh, situation in Mexico, whether it's immigration or other things is a little, little tricky, and now we're seeing changes in U.S. relations with Cuba. Do you have any thoughts on our own hemisphere? Well, I mean, for 200 years, America has tried to maintain uh, order and stability throughout the Western Hemisphere, especially in the northern half of it, which would include especially Venezuela and Colombia north of the Amazon Basin. Um, the President's um, um, <coughs> actions on Cuba in December, similar to his actions on Iran, Cuba was being driven to its knees by the falling price of oil, cutting off Venezuelan support, and he continued his bad tendency to let our adversaries up off the mat at, once we've got them down to the mat. Um, but, you know, for the most part, Countries in the Western Hemisphere want country, what countries in Eurasia and Africa want. They want American leadership, and they want the American assistance uh, that military, economic, diplomatic, uh, cultural strength brings. Their leaders may not always want that, but the peoples do. And you know, the Western Hemisphere, as you say, has largely been um, you know, more quiet than Eurasia has been in recent years, but we can't take that for granted, and we have to maintain it. Yeah. You know, we look at the politics in Venezuela, we look at the economics, I think some kind of an implosion. Well, it's hard to say which really is more dysfunctional, Venezuelan politics or economics, but they're both very bad. All right. Uh, and look, but look at what America has done uh, in our policy towards Colombia over the last 15 or 20 years. We've taken a state that was largely controlled by uh, uh, narcotic terrorists, uh, narcotic gangs and terrorists that kind of merged in different ways uh, and turned it into a relatively stable uh, ally of the United States uh, with you know a relatively growing economy, without really putting uh, many Americans on the ground there. Obviously, we had some doing some special missions or advisory work mm -hmm. and stuff. But the Columbia plan has has largely worked, uh, and it's a real testament to America's influence and to the commitment that we had to turn that country around. That that plan, that model, can work el elsewhere. Great. 
Well, listen, we have taken more of your time than you uh, had originally stipulated to give. It's, it's been a great pleasure and an honor talking with you, Senator, and I, and I look forward to many more years of, of interesting initiatives coming from your office. Thank, Thank you, Walter. Appreciate it. Thank you.